There you go. Hello, it's uh, Gene Tunney here from Adept Economics and Queensland Economy Watch. Joining me today to speak about how Queensland's regional economies have been impacted by COVID-19 and the mitigation measures for COVID-19 is Pete Faulkner, Director of Conus Business uh, Consultancy Services. Pete, good to be speaking with you. Good afternoon, Gene. Good to talk to you again. Excellent. So, Pete, you're, uh, you're based in far north Queensland and you've been doing a lot of work over the years on Queensland's regional economies. You've produced your own trend estimates of labour force data. And what you've been doing lately is producing some great estimates of employment and unemployment in the different regions of Queensland based on the ABS data and uh, job seeker data that have come out. So I'd like to speak with you about those today. Okay, now to start with, it'd be good to go over some data that you sent that I found quite fascinating. These are the data from the uh, Google community mobility uh, data set. Let's have a look at those. And what's that showing, Pete? That's showing that Queensland is actually doing better than most other states and territories. Is that right? Yeah, it is. Look, I mean, first off, let me uh, acknowledge that the, the graph actually came from James Foster. I, I nicked it off his Twitter feed, so um, I'm sure he'll be okay with that as long as I acknowledge it. Um, okay. Yeah, so look, I mean, this is this is Google community mobility data. So it's, it's very much just kind of proxy for economic activity. Um, and as you can see, you know, we saw a dramatic decline as we all went into lockdown at the end of March, early April. Uh, and then there's been this slow grind up. The, the thing that really struck me about this, this particular set of data, and it really sort of brought home the fact that this is a health crisis that's, that's, that's um, precipitating an, an economic crisis. And the way that we're gonna, and the speed that we're gonna come out of this economic crisis is to a very great extent gonna depend upon the health outcomes of the crisis, how we handle the health outcomes. Um, and you know, yes, of course, fiscal policy, monetary policy from governments and all of the rest of it is, is clearly going to make an impact and we know that it's making an impact. But at the bottom line, if we don't get the health situation under control, we're not going to get the economic situation under control. And with that in mind, I think this, this particular chart really highlighted to me a couple of points. The first is that where the um, health uh, results or the response are not as positive i.e. Victoria at the moment, obviously, we are seeing a dramatic decline in the recovery and economic activities. So the, the, the line there for, for Victoria has turned very sharply downwards over the past couple of weeks as they went into their stage three lockdowns. And obviously on today's numbers, you know, almost another 500 cases. Um, you know, there's certainly talk about it perhaps won't be too long until they're even going back into stage four um, restrictions. Um, likewise, you can see New South Wales, at the moment, um, community transmission in New South Wales appears to be quite limited. They've only got a, a limited number of cases. There's certainly no suggestion yet that they're going anywhere like the way that Victoria's gone. But even there, you can see that there's a reduction in economic activity. That's the light blue line. And those two together, obviously being the dominant economies within, within the Australia as a whole, have, have turned the, the dotted line, which is the Australian um, outlook, significantly weaker in the past couple of weeks. So that's on the negative. On the positive, where we've seen what I think is undeniably a very positive health outcome, we've seen significantly better economic outcomes, at least by measured by um, uh, this mobility index. And Queensland is the kind of standout there. If we go back to mm -hmm. prior to COVID, the purple line or the maroon line, uh, which was Queensland, was sort of sitting in the middle of the pack, below state, below national average. Uh, nothing much happening, everybody collapsed at pretty much the same point and at pretty much the same sp um, speed. The Queensland response, whilst it's drawn a lot of flack, particularly in terms of keeping borders closed maybe longer than some had wanted, 
um, has paid dividends and it's paying economic dividends as well as health, health dividends. And I think that's the point that this chart really makes clear. We're seeing Queensland recover better than the states where the health outcomes have been worse. Um, and, and that I think is, is a, because essentially the, the government, I think, and you, you know, as I say, you can criticize them for, for locking down and, and not opening up soon enough, but I think they trod that kind of fine line between opening up the economy and at the same time maintaining a control of the health situation actually pretty well to the point that we are now performing better or have performed better than any other state in the nation. And I would contrast that not only obviously with New South Wales and Victoria, where we know that they've got health issues, um, but Tasmania. Tasmania hasn't had any cases for a long time, or certainly no significant number of cases, and there's, there's no community transmission as far as I know. They're still locked down. This, the borders are still shut. Um, they've had one of the biggest per capita um, state stimulus packages in the country, and yet, and yet, their recovery has been much, much more muted. So that would suggest to me that Tasmania perhaps has erred on the, the wrong side of that caution and indeed has been too cautious. So they've got the good health outcome, but they haven't got the good economic outcome that we have. Right. Okay. Fascinating. Might have to look at, I'll have to keep uh, an eye on the future updates of those data. So that's from, did you mean, was it James it's Foster? James, yeah, James Foster at um, FM, who's... Um, yeah, if you search him on Twitter, I'm sure you'll find yes. it. Yes. I, I often follow his stuff. And it just, that, that chart this morning just kind of jumped out at me in terms of, you know, th there's a real narrative there, as I say, I think, between this idea of the balance between the health outcome and the economic outcome. And, you know, yeah, you could get a great health outcome if you just shut everything down. We know that. Um, but you're going to get a terrible economic outcome. What's interesting, I think, is that if you don't get it right, you end up with the worst of both worlds i.e. Victoria, where you've got a bad health health outcome and a bad economic outcome. Yep. Yep. Really good point, Pete. Okay. Well, let's chat about Queensland specifically. Mm. And I thought I would start the discussion of Queensland by looking at the impacts by industry, because to me, the way we get a sense of how it's impacting on different regions or how it's, we expect it will impact on different regions is to look at how is it impacting by industry and then look at how are different regions specialising in different industries. And so therefore, as we'd expect with this uh, COVID-19 situation with the social distancing measures, the restrictions, it's been accommodation and food services that, and also arts and recreation services that have been hardest hit. With the accommodation and food services, that's hospitality, so tourism as well. And that's most concentrated within far north, or the, the regions with high concentrations are uh, far north Queensland, Whitsundays, Gold Coast. So we'd expect that those regions would have the, the largest economic impacts. Correct. Okay. Now let's move on to your estimates. Uh, so I think you've been doing a great job in keeping these estimates updated with all of the latest data. I'll have to think about the best position of our, our faces here. But Pete, would you be able to take us through your estimates of the unemployment rate and employment changes that you've been keeping updated and, and let us know, broadly speaking, what's the methodology that you've used, please? Yeah, certainly, Gene. So, look, I was actually listening to a podcast or a webinar rather this morning from um, Saul Leslake, who was, who's been doing some modelling work as well. And it was really interesting because he said... The way he's done it this time um, has been much more based on a kind of sectoral um, analysis, which is exactly how I've been doing this since March. Um, and interestingly, our numbers are, are coming out quite similarly, so myself and, and Saul Leslake. So essentially, as, as you explained on that first chart, what I've really been doing is looking at the breakdown of the economies, both at the national state and then regional levels, um, in terms of the contribution that each of those industry sectors is making to uh, gross national product, gross state product, or, or gross regional product in the case of the, the local government areas. Um, 
and then using all of the available data that we're getting, so data out of the ATO from the single touch payroll stuff, um, things like the, the Google and Apple data in terms of mobility and economic activity, tourism data, retail sales data, all of this you know, construction data, building approvals, anything we can get to try and get a sense of how much are each of these sectors being impacted in terms of a downturn in economic activity, and therefore how much of that is going to be reflected in each particular um, area dependent upon the percentage of that uh, industry's um, importance to that particular region. So that's been the methodology. Um, you know, it's certainly not as, as complex um, or as sophisticated, I'm sure, as the, you know, the, the modeling that Treasury, for instance, would be doing. But interestingly, the numbers aren't coming out and have never come out, actually, that have been significantly different to what Treasury had been forecasting. So right from the beginning, um, whilst our forecasts then, certainly for unemployment, were higher than they are now, so were Treasury, for the same reason, because we didn't, I don't think anybody built in the kind of decline in participation that we've seen since um, you know, since March. So whilst Treasury at the moment, I think, and, and the Reserve Bank, I think, are looking around about six, six and a half percent decline nationally through calendar 2020, we're a little bit more optimistic than that. We've got about five and a half percent, but to be honest, five and a half percent, six percent, six and a half percent. I mean, at, this, at these kind of scales, it's a, it's a bit of sort of potato potato thing, isn't it? Yeah. What um, um, measure are you talk are you talking about there, Pete? That's GDP. Or? So that's, that's GDP. GDP. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Yeah, so real, real GDP. Um, and interestingly, as I say, Saul's um, commentary this morning, um, given that he's using a very similar methodology to calculate, he's looking at 4.5% GDP decline, so even, even more optimistic than mine. Um, but he did acknowledge that the, what's happening in Victoria could well wipe off another 1% to 1.5% off his numbers, which would bring them very much into line with mine. So that's the kind of methodology, um, at least for the, uh, for the growth position and, and then in terms of employment we've utilized something very similar in the sense that we've looked at what the, the makeup of the labor force at those particular area um, levels so either national state or regional um, and applied a similar kind of uh, reduction actually easier to do for the employment because obviously we're getting those bi month uh, bi-weekly data streams out of the uh, the abs um, for payrolls data and and broken down at a um, industry and then subsector industry level um, even at the regional level we're getting those somewhat delayed to be fair but we're still getting them so the abs are doing a great job in providing us with some data which i think are making sure that we keep these unemployment numbers um, pretty accurate or at least the employment numbers i would say the unemployment number is, is far more of a kind of uh, touchy-feely thing because it's been so driven by what's happened to participation yeah. Um, well, Josh. You know, yeah, yeah. And uh, Josh Frydenberg's noted that. Look, he accepts that unemployment is much higher than has been that has been reported that by than the uh, ABS. It's probably around thirteen percent or so nationally if you use the job seeker figures. Yeah. So yeah, yeah. Good point. But just on the, I just want to make sure I understand this right. So because you mentioned the GDP figures before, mm. so over the year. By December quarter, you're thinking over the year it could be a, around a five percent decline. Correct. Yeah, that's uh, calendar year. Yeah, calendar year. Yeah. For so for June quarter, that's relative to the previous quarter. So a decline of nine over nine percent for Australia, nearly seven percent for Queensland. Yeah. So it's looking like Australia, like the, the national reduction the national uh, downturn is is larger than what we've seen in queensland although obviously it's still massive in queensland mm. yeah and look that part certainly on the quarterly quarter, quarter by quarter basis okay. part of that is driven simply by the fact that the first quarter queensland numbers were weaker than the national numbers so first quarter to second oh, quarter yeah. decline is is less for queensland because the starting point was somewhat lower that's, oh, that's okay gotcha yeah what I think is interesting, and this has changed over the past kind of couple of weeks as we run this model, um, you know, as you, as you imagine, data comes in almost daily at this stage. So, um, you know, we've been running the model quite frequently. And what's been changing over the past couple of weeks is that that gap on the far right hand column there between 5.4 and 4.8 has, has been widening. Um, and that goes back to the point we made right at the beginning that this is a health crisis 
precipitating an economic crisis. And because Queensland's done better on the health front, um, at least in our model, we're actually looking to do better. It's, it's you know, it's, it's translating to a, to a uh, materially better GDP outcome by the end of the year, simply because we've done better on the health outcomes. Um, yeah. The economy is doing better than the nation as a whole. Makes sense to me. Okay, so what about the regional impacts? Could you take us through those, please, Pete? What are the regions worst yeah. affected? So look, I, I'm not going to go in through all of those because there's obviously a lot on there. But um, the, 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 the sort of take home message, I guess, is that obviously, as you've already pointed out, the, the sectors that are most heavily impacted are, are around the tourism sector, um, accommodation, food services, to a lesser degree, retail, um, arts and recreation. So any region that is more heavily reliant on those sectors is, is naturally going to be suffering more. Um, and, and that's certainly played out in the, in, the, in the model. So if you're looking at the unemployment rates by the end of this year, um, and this now incorporates JobKeeper 2.0. So this is, you know, we've, we've been working on essentially, it was pretty clear that JobKeeper 2.0 was coming anyway. So we'd already built it into the model prior to that, as you know, because you've seen the, the no and yes um, tables previously. So with JobKeeper 2.0 now in place, um, we're still looking at Cairns, so that's the local government area, so Cairns Regional Council area, still above 9%, even by the end of the year, even with JobKeeper 2.0 in place. So there's some really heavy impacts that, um, that are being felt up here. Um, our estimation is that we're probably somewhere around 10.5% at the moment in the Cairns Council area. Um, it may go a little higher. Um, I noticed um, when Philip Lowe was speaking yesterday, the Reserve Bank seemed to be suggesting that whilst we're looking at employment growth, and they're certainly looking at employment growth um, from here on in, they're also aware that we might see an actual move up in the unemployment rate as more people come back into the labour force, so the participation rate goes up. So that's really the kind of curveball in all of this. We're not quite sure what's going to happen with participation. But I think the, the bottom line is that we're, we're at or close to peaks in unemployment rates, at least, um, but I don't see them coming down very quickly in those areas where we're most heavily impacted by tourism. Yeah, so Cairns, very badly affected. Gold Coast too, the yeah. big loss of jobs on the Gold Coast. Yeah. So, yeah, 20 to 30,000. Likewise. Right. Um, you know, nearly 10%. Douglas Shire, so, I mean, that's obviously a very small area, but just up the road from Cairns, uh, Port Douglas, basically 15%. Um, Wet Sundays, 17%. These are by the end of the year, and this is even with JobKeeper 2.0 in place. So, right. really significant um, levels of unemployment still in those areas. Okay, so I'll put these, uh, these slides in the show notes for people so they can consult these. Uh, but let I'll just move our images so we can see the uh, the GDP losses, your estimated GDP losses by the end of the year. Douglas, so down nearly 13% over the year. Yeah. Gold Coast, 6%, Cairns, 7%. Townsville, yeah, minus 3.8%. Mackay, so Mackay benefits from having mining in the, exactly. in the region. Exactly. Exactly. Yeah. Yeah. And, and I think the important point there, Gene, and I've, I've been making this in a number of webinars that I've been doing and, and talks that I've been doing, is that we're not looking at a V-shaped recovery. I mean, I don't think anybody is now genuinely considering that we're just going to snap back from this. It's going to take some time. Um, even where we've seen some big declines, so like Cairns, down 7%, to put that in some kind of context, the Cairns average growth over the past sort of three few years has been three three and a half percent so pretty good you know the, the economy's going been growing pretty well but even even given that even when we get back to trend growth we're still two or three years away of growth just to make up for what we've lost this year and you know let's not kid ourselves with with realistically no sign of international tourism anytime for at least the next 12 possibly 18 months there's no way that Cairns is getting anywhere near back to trend growth anytime soon. Therefore, the recovery is going to take a very extended period of time. You know, we, we're going to have to get used to a, a lower growth environment, uh, and, it's, and it's therefore going to take a long time to, to make up these losses. 
even in areas where the declines aren't that great. So um, areas like the Cassidy Coast, um, which is very agricultural, declines of only 3%, but the reality is that their trend growth rate is only about 1%. So it's still, even getting back to trend, it's still three years worth of growth. Oh, absolutely. Yep. We'll see uh, long lasting impacts. Absolutely. Okay. Let's uh, have a look at some of the other slides. Oh, this is the chart of yeah, so this the is job seeker. Yes. Yeah. If you could explain this, Pete, I forget this is something you sent, uh, you sent yesterday. Yeah. yeah so this was um, some work that the, uh, the treasury put out um, looking at job seeker and the number of the number of job seekers and how they've increased um, and they they measured it a whole bunch of ways they looked at absolute numbers which obviously wasn't really very interesting because you know simply the biggest electorates had the biggest numbers no, no big surprise there but this one I thought was the was the was the more interesting one and this is showing percentage of um, the workforce or working working population I should say um, percentage of the working population that were receiving uh, job seeker or what was new start and youth allowance so by end of December 2019 so end of last year it would have been new start and um, job seeker and the particular interest for me is is Leichhardt there which is uh, Warren Inch's seat these are the federal electorates um, and basically that's Ken's um, and what you've got there is Leichhardt sitting, what is it, seventh or eighth on that table at the end of 2019 with just over 8% of the total working age population receiving some form of benefit. Move that forward to May and it's jumped to third in the country um, and it is almost 15%. So almost, you know, over one in eight, or one in seven people um, in the, uh, the federal electorate at like are currently receiving some kind of um, support, either job seeker or youth allowance. This isn't job keeper. This is this is people. Yeah, these are numbers from Sentinel. So Leichhardt, this is is it Cairns and the the it's surrounding basically Cairns. Yeah, basically it's Cairns, it's basically right? Cairns it inc includes um, Port Douglas as well, but it only goes down about as far as Gordon Vale, and then it all turns into Kennedy, which is. Um, and which is huge, obviously, and that takes in the rest of the Cape and goes out west. And that's yeah. Bob seat. So Hinkler, that's uh, around Bundaberg, and that's yeah. still in second. So that was always high. And exactly, and Lingiari as well, up in the territory, very mm. high. You know, Wide bays moved up. Yeah. Wide bays moved up a few places. It has. Yeah. So I mean, one of the legacies of this uh, COVID nineteen period is that some of our vulnerable regional economies or, or regions where there is significant disadvantage. I mean, Bundaberg and, and Cairns too, they have a lot of good things going for them. At the same time, there is still significant disadvantage there. We could see that disadvantage uh, continue. It, it's, it, it's extended. It's, uh, yeah, we've got more people who, yeah. who are, well, uh, you know, suffering, who, yeah, who are at risk of uh, long-term unemployment in these regions. Exactly. I mean, it's, you know, we hear it all the time. People talk about the scarring effects of, of recession or depression. Um, and obviously in an area where disadvantage is greater, that scarring is going to be greater and it's going to be longer lasting. That's, that's really the issue here, I think, is that whilst we're looking at a high percentage of people unemployed, a high percentage of people receiving some kind of support, uh, an economy that's going to take a long time to grind its way back from what is a quite significant decline. Um, you know, all of that is going to have long-term scarring issues on, on the economy um, in, of this region. Unless, of course, and, you know, looking positively, unless, of course, um, the organisations and the, the business organisations uh, and, and local government and state government can work together to work out how we can change the dynamic essentially and see this as an opportunity. We can look at diversification of economies, look at diversification of, of um, employment opportunities, training opportunities, all of those kind of things. You know, the new green economies, can we be the green smarter city? You know, we've got opportunities for renewables, we've got opportunities around the environment generally up here. Um, you know, do we have to rely so heavily on tourism because if we do we're going to, it's going to be a long drag a long drag 
because international tourism is not coming back for a long time. And even when it does, even when international borders open up, I don't know about you, but I'm thinking that people's traveling habits are likely to change. I don't think we're going to see international travel in the same way that we did at the end of 2019 yeah. for a long time, if ever. Well, what I've heard is that some people have been money that they would have that they've set aside for future international travel. They're now spending on home improvements or on AV gear for the home or other things like that. So yeah. yes, yes, yeah. I absolutely uh, agree with you there. Right. Okay. Pete, anything else in terms of regional economic impacts you'd like to say before we wrap up? No, look, I think the real takeaway here is that, you know, this is this is a very granular picture. I mean, it always is. You know, we know the the um, Australian economy is, is very granular and, and the Queensland economy in particular. You know, as, as you and I well know, you know, Queensland is the most regionally diverse economy we've got. Uh, it's pretty much 50% Greater Brisbane and 50% everybody else. Um, you know, that's that's nothing like what it is in Victoria or New South Wales. So this idea that we need to focus on the Queensland regions, I think is really um, important. I'm not saying overly focus. I'm not saying focus on the regions to the detriment of, of Greater Brisbane, far from it. Um, but I do think we need to acknowledge that we need to put a, you know an equal emphasis on the regions as we do on the southeast corner. Um, and we need to understand that there are going to be some very, very disadvantaged areas coming out of this. And there are going to be other areas that are going to do much better. You know, you, you, you highlighted Mackay already. Um, you know, Mackay had been doing quite well prior to that. Relatively, Mackay is going to be an absolute standout. If, if, you know, if it only does see declines of in gross regional products of, was it 2%, 2 point something percent, um, you know, Mackay is going to be an absolute star um, looking forward, mm. despite a turn down. Um, so I think that's the important thing to take out of this is that it really is very, very granular. And I think state governments in particular need to be looking at that granularity and working out targeted approaches, part targeted policy approaches um, at, at that level. I don't expect the, 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 um, the federal government to do it, honestly. I think it's too, you know, the, the federal government's too big. And, I, and I'm actually pleased, I have to say, that the way that they've um, changed JobKeeper, so the JobKeeper 2.0, because there was some talk of people saying, oh, well, maybe they're going to target it regionally or target it by industry. Yes, sector. yes, yeah, I thought yeah. that, yes. Yeah, I mean, I, and certainly that was an option, I think. Um, I always cautioned against the idea of doing it on, a, on an industry level, simply because how do you define who's a tourism industry? You know, up here, for instance, everybody's a tourism industry at some level or other. Um, so that idea of, you know, the kind of vagaries between whether you're a a tourism industry or not i think would have been made that really hard doing it on a geographic basis so the regional approach i think probably would have worked but again it, there could have been some very bizarre situations where you had you know somebody on one side of the road essentially getting getting job keeper support and somebody on the other side not so i think they've actually done it well by tapering it the way they're doing um, by tightening up the eligibility and by re uh, rechecking eligibility on a three monthly rolling basis i think that makes sense yeah uh, I think that might cause some issues, though, the way they've, they're defining eligibility. I think they might have to adopt an al some alternative tests just because there may be some businesses which arguably need the assistance, deserve the assistance, but which could miss out because, look, they could have lost 80% of their turnover in that June quarter, say a gym, for example, and then, you know, there's a they bounce back part of the way and they, and may, maybe now they're down 25%. So they want in the September, December quarter, whatever quarter it is where the eligibility is tested. And yeah. so they lose access to JobKeeper, but because they lost so much in that June quarter, they're yeah. still in financial trouble. Yeah. So, yeah. you know, there Look, might I, think, be... I think it's going to be depend. And I, 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 at this stage, I don't think they, They've nutted out the absolute details in terms of that. If you remember when they rolled out JobKeeper initially, mm. um, the ATO actually were, were really good. I mean, I spoke to the ATO on, a, on behalf of a number of clients around these kind of issues, um, and the ATO were great. They yes, really were. Yes. They said, "Look, we're going to. It's it's self-assessed. Uh, you know, as long as you, you you're doing it as honestly as you can, and you can provide us with some. If we do come and audit it at some point down the track, as long as you've prepared to." 
put your hand on your heart and, and provide us with some data that supports a genuine uh, acknowledgement that you or an expectation that your turnover was going to drop. Um, and I think they've carried through on that. I think they've been really yes. open and, and flexible. I suspect they won't be quite as flexible this time because obviously they're, they're not going to have to be relying on those projections any longer. It's all, it's all about yes. the backward looking rather than forward looking. But look, I think there's ways they can do that. You know, we can we could look at six month averages. We could look at you know quarterly averages compared to quarters, similar quarters over a number of years. There's there's all kinds of ways that I think we could get round that. But I absolutely take your point. I think there is a risk that anybody that's bounced, you know, mm. suddenly things have opened and they've they've bounced. They've managed to open up again, might drop out. I think that would be a concern. So I would hope that the ATO will be as accommodating and realistic and flexible as they were during JobKeeper 1.0. Okay. Now, if you're watching this recording, I'd recommend that you, if you don't do so already, do regularly uh, follow Pete on Twitter or at his uh, blog at uh, konos.com.au, is it? Have I got that yeah, right? Correct. Yeah. And I'll put a yeah. link in the, the notes. And you'll be updating these figures, uh, I understand, Pete, because there'll be some new regional labour force data out tomorrow. But you do, I, I wouldn't expect that make a huge difference to those numbers we talked about today, would you? I, I wouldn't think so. I don't think. It, I mean, certainly not going to change the story. The story is the same. Um, mm. there, there might be some tweaking at the edges, you know. And, and again, as we said earlier, I think to a large degree, it's going to depend on whether there's any significant movements in participation. Uh, at a regional level, but at this stage, I'm not. I'm certainly not expecting any. None of the regions have really been uh, surprising me. Let's put it that way. The, yeah. the May, you know, the April May numbers were pretty much as I expected. So uh, I doubt the June ones going to be a big shock. Yeah. Now one of the points I wanted to inject that I've just finally is that one of the challenges we have is that because we always have new entrants to the labour market, so as people leave school or uni and then come into the labor market. If there are people who've lost jobs during a crisis like this and they haven't got another job, then they're competing with all the new entrants. And that's one of the reasons why it takes so long for unemployment to come down, isn't it? That's one of the reasons. Yeah. No, absolutely. And I mean, our modeling um, incorporates that increase in working population as well. So we've got a, each month, there's a you know, and, and obviously at a, at um, it's increasing at various rates depending on the regions. But we've got historical data, and you know, as you know, population growth is a pretty static um, uh, you know growth rate. So you can you can forecast it forward pretty well. Um, so we've got we've got that increase in in working population built into the model. Yes, as I said before, the, the huge unknown in this, and the thing that just throws everything out is is the participation rate. And if we see yeah. You know, if we see the participation rate start improving again, um, which we haven't yet, but I suspect we will, and when we see the participation rate start picking up again, that's going to have a really big negative impact, or an impact in terms of pushing up the unemployment rate, yeah. even if we're seeing employment growth. Um, and, and that's a point that Philip Lowe was making yesterday, and I'd certainly uh, concur with that. I think, you know, we... This is confusing, and there's no point just focusing on a headline unemployment rate. We need to be looking at a whole range of data on the labour market to actually get a feel for what's going on, including, most importantly, probably hours work. Yeah, absolutely. Just on the uh, the population growth, one point that I think is worth noting is that we're not going to have much in terms of net overseas migration, are we, this year? No. Mate, is, no. Could it actually be negative? Is that what they're saying? The... Um, yeah, I guess it could. I mean, it's certainly going to slow. There's no question it's going to slow right down. Um, so yeah, and and that's I, mean, I have to admit that isn't built into the model. Okay, that's the okay. Then we'll see what the Treasury says tomorrow in their uh, their yeah. budget, their mini budget that mini budget, they yeah. release tomorrow because they'll be in a good position to to forecast what's going to happen with net overseas migration and what's going to happen with uh, population growth. I'll be fascinated to see yeah. what they come which, up with. Which there. is actually a really important point, Gene, as well. I mean, I'm glad you made it because, you know, one of the drivers, one of the reasons that we've been such a lucky country for whatever it was, 28, 29 years, uh, was on the back of some very strong population growth. Um, and we're not going to get that anytime soon coming back. You know, that's, that's mm. gone. So that's one of the planks 
that, that held us up for some time, um, combine that with China. Um, and it's going to be it's going to be a tough drag out of this. I know, honestly, I don't think at the moment, at least, I don't think the markets are quite building in the, the scale of or the, 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 the length of time it's going to take to recover from this event. Absolutely. Look, the financial markets, the, yeah, that's, a, that's another story. We'll have to chat about yeah, exactly, that sometime. Yeah. But yeah, yeah, absolutely. That's, that's, one, that's, one, that's one when we've got a couple of beers in our hands. <laughs> absolutely. Okay, Pete Faulkner from Conus Business Consultancy Services. That's been great. I've really enjoyed chatting with you. Great. Nice to speak to you again, Jane. Thanks very much. Thanks, Pete.